Hello again, welcome to video 4.2. Today you'll be looking at how Bohr's model was changed to help tell us more about the electron's placement and its energy. And so, we begin. As we build on Bohr's model of the atom, we start calling it the quantum model of the atom. And quantum will come in a little bit later when we start looking at its quantum numbers. You were introduced to the idea of a quantum, which is a lowest energy uh, needed for um, a metal to release an electron using the photoelectric effect. So a quantum of energy, so quantum more or less relating to energy. So we're going to look at energy and how that has changed our model of the atom. First person we're going to introduce you to is Louis de Broglie. He says that electrons also behave as waves. If we could have photons, which basically have no mass, so very small packets of energy that behave as waves and particles, why can't the electrons, which are also very small particles, behave as waves? Heisenberg adds to this with his uncertainty principle, and it states, it is impossible to tell the velocity and position of an electron at the same time. So let's think about if we have a person walking around the room. So they're walking, walking, walking. Well, we could say how fast they were walking. We could measure that, you know, look at their velocity, find out how much energy they're exerting from their velocity, and we could look at them moving around the room. However, if we wanted to know where they were at any particular second, we wouldn't be able to do that because they are constantly moving. So we can give an idea of where they're moving, an idea of how big maybe the circle is that they are walking in, but we wouldn't be able to tell you exactly where they are located. If we wanted to find that out, we would actually have to stop that person and say they are in this spot at this time, but at that time they would have no velocity. Then a Schrodinger with the idea and help of Heisenberg, lays the foundation for this quantum theory. And there it is. There's the equation. Do I want you to know that equation? Of course not. That math is probably beyond me at this point, too. These are very smart mathematicians. So they used mathematics, or physicists if you want, probably, uh, use of mathematics to describe the wave particles of the electrons and thus, if they could do it for electrons, they could do it for other really small particles. How Bohr's model has changed? Well, we say electrons do not travel in these nice circular orbits, but they exist in regions called orbitals. So again, we can't say it's in a certain ring because then we would have, it wouldn't have any velocity to say it's there. And the electrons are constantly moving. So we're going to say they don't actually travel in orbits but regions. So we can say within this region around the nucleus, we would maybe be able to find the electron. So an orbital is just a 3D region, because of course the nucleus is 3D. It goes in three dimensions around the nucleus, and it indicates the probable location of an electron. Again, keyword is probable. Do we know it definitely is in that spot? No, we'd have to stop the electron, thus it wouldn't have any energy. So we say it is a probable location of an electron. To describe the electron fully and what energy it carries and where we think it's located and how far from the nucleus, we come up with some quantum numbers. So these will specify the properties of the orbitals and the electrons that are in those specific orbitals or those regions around the nucleus. So there are four quantum numbers. Funny thing is, the quantum numbers aren't exactly numbers, they're more letters, uh, but there are four of them to help describe, and we call them quantum numbers. So the first one is the principal quantum number, which is n. This is the main energy level of the electron. Where is it, um, if you want to think of Bohr's model, how far out from the nucleus is this electron located? So this is the main energy level of the electron. Where does it most likely reside? Uh, for a particular electron, what is its, if you like, ground state? As n increases, the electron then gets further from the nucleus. And the number of sublevels that can exist at an energy level is n. 
So we will get into sublevels, uh, or you will see them in our next quantum number. But the number of sublevels that can exist at an energy level is n. So if we are in the first energy level, we have one sublevel. If we are in the second energy level, we have two sublevels, and so forth. So your angular momentum quantum number is your second one, and this is often given the symbol L. An angular momentum quantum number just tells us the shape of the orbital. Again, we said these weren't nice uh, orbits, so they aren't nice circles. And you're going to see, as you can see in the picture, that they come in different shapes. So where that electron will be depends on this angular momentum quantum number. And how we get these shapes is all, again, based on math. So the orbitals possible at any energy level is n squared. So remember, n is your energy level, and we square it to find the possible orbitals that we can have. So at the first energy level, 1 squared is 1, so we would have one possible orbital. At energy level 2, you have 2 squared, so you have 4, so you're going to have 4 possible orbitals. Different orbitals then can have sublevels. So the first one we have is a, or is an S sublevel. This is where we talked about the number of sublevels at an energy level for the principal quantum number. So these are your sublevels as we get into them. So the S is spherical. Nice thing is the S. Keep with the S. So S sublevel, spherical, and it holds one orbital. And that's because it encompasses all the 3D regions. Our second sublevel shape is P sublevel. I like to call it a peanut shape. That way we remember P and peanut. And it can hold three orbitals. So this would be one orbital here. So here's our peanut. Uh, my drawing's not really a good peanut, but there's one peanut shape. Then we have the second one that's this direction, and we have a third one that's in that direction. So we have one peanut shape for the three directions, your X, your Y, and your Z on a 3D plane. So it can hold up to three orbitals. The third sublevel shape is the D sublevel. I like to call this the double dumbbell, just to keep the Ds together. You can see, though, it looks more like uh, a double peanut. Uh, is P, but I like to do the double dumbbell, and it holds five different shapes. Uh, so we've got our double dumbbell here where we have two kind of overlapped, and they're going to lie along the X, Y, and Z axis, and then we get some others going on here. You can see how this totally changes shape as we get into that fifth orbital. But again, all together, this is the shape that it would look if we had an electron in each of those orbitals. And then we have the F sublevel. I like to call it flower because it looks more flower, plus then it starts with F. So F sublevel, flower shape. And it holds seven orbitals. Again, there you can see the different shapes, one for the X, Y, Z axis, and then different orientations around that. And again, you get this D-looking shape, uh, or that one from the D-looking shape, but it is an F orbital, but it changes. Again, as a cluster, it would look like this around the nucleus. Those are all the different orbitals that these electrons can be in. And how we know we have these different orbitals, if you wanted to look at them under an electron microscope, these would be pictures of real orbitals, where you have... This as probably an S orbital. And it's probably in that first energy level close to the nucleus. This would be an S here. But you can see we've grown. You've got a center right there. And then it's a little bit bigger on the outside. But now we have an introduction of a P orbital. You can kind of see that peanut shape forming. So this would be like an N equals 1. N, oops say n equals 2. 
Here now we have an S, a P, and we've introduced our D. So we're building on the S. So you can see each time we change orbitals, we get larger and larger. It kind of wraps around what was already there. So here's our little P from 2, and then we've got the larger P for N equals 3. Then we've got S, P, D, and F coming in at N equals 4. And then we're just going to have different S, P, Ds, and another different F, maybe a different orientation of an F. So this would be an F. This would also be just an F, just a different orientation at more of an N equals 5. So you can see they build on top of each other and they overlap each other. Uh, so the higher in energy you get, the bigger that orbital does become. So the next of our quantum numbers is our magnetic quantum number, which is M. And this is the orientation of an orbital around the nucleus. So if we looked at the P sublevel here, which is what it's showing you, the P, we have three different orbitals that the P electron can be in. So it can be in our X, our Y, or our Z plane as it's showing us there. So the magnetic quantum number would tell us which orbital that it's actually in. So in this case, it's the PX, the PY, PZ, and of course, it's going to get a little bit different once you get into the D and the F, but it would tell you which of those orbitals that it's in, which of the 5D, which of the 7F specific orbitals we are looking at. The last quantum number is your spin quantum number. So this indicates the direction of electron spin. So yes, as the electrons are moving around, they themselves are spinning. And when they spin, they create a magnetic field. We know that each orbital can hold up to two electrons, so they must have opposite spins. If they have the same spin, they're going to create the same magnetic field. Well, if they create both positive, they're going to or repel. If they create both negative, they're going to repel. So they must have opposite spins so that at one point it's creating a positive and the other one is creating a negative so that they can be in that same space. Again, the space we're talking about is very tiny. Even though we are in these different orbitals and they're going to be in these different places, so you think about what's going on in an atom, it's getting very complicated. When we are asking you to look at quantum numbers, we are going to focus on the N and we are going to focus on the L. Uh, could we start labeling the M and the spin quantum number? Sure, why not? But we're not going to get into that in this class. So I'm not going to have you start labeling which one you think it's going to be in. And we're going to focus on the energy level and the type of orbital that it's going to be in. Let's look at this as we try to decide how many electrons um, an element or an atom may have. So we have different energy levels. So we know we have energy level symbolized by N. So if we are in the first energy level, we know that the number of orbitals is N squared. So if we are in the first energy level, our n squared is going to be 1, so it can hold 1 orbital, which means the number of electrons is 2n squared, so our number of electrons we can hold would be 2. In our second energy level, n squared is 4, so we can hold a total of 4 orbitals which means our number of electrons that we can hold would be 4 times 2, or 8 electrons. So what this is kind of saying is we have S here, and this can hold S and the 3P that we have, because we have three different orbitals of P. In energy level 3, number of orbitals that we can have would be 3 squared, or 9. And 2 times 9 would mean 18 electrons. This pattern should kind of look familiar, 2, 8, 18. So this is saying we have 
the 1 for S, the 3 for, for P, and the 5 for D, so and so forth. If we were looking at the orbitals themselves, so we were looking at S, P, and D, an S orbital, or an S sublevel, I'm sorry, has one orbital, which means it can hold two electrons. A P has three orbitals, thus it could hold six electrons. D has five orbitals, which means it can hold ten electrons. And, oops, F has seven orbitals, which means it can hold 14 electrons. So you start adding these up and that's where we are getting these numbers. You start adding these up, that's where we are getting these numbers for this energy level. Mm -hmm.